And once again, good morning, church. Well, Easter Sunday may be in the rearview mirror on the calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. It's very much in our sights as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <coughs> as we saw last week, the resurrection of Jesus validated his claim to be the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. It is the grounding truth of Christian faith and the essential element in our message. But the resurrection is not simply an event from long ago that we celebrate. Neither is it merely a theological truth that we affirm as a necessary part of our faith. Both of those are crucial to our faith, the event and the theological truth. But the resurrection is equally important for another reason. The resurrection is a present tense reality, a spiritual reality that allows us to experience the living God in all of his transforming power. Our scripture passage this morning takes us back three days before the resurrection. Prior to his crucifixion, on the night when he, was, when he would be betrayed, Jesus met with the disciples and spent a long time talking with them about what was going to happen. And John's Gospel, chapters 13 through 17, contains much of this lengthy discourse and the conversation that happened that night. One of the topics of that conversation that was particularly important concerned the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is the focus of much of the content of chapters 14 to 16. In the first 11 verses that we read from John 14, Jesus emphasizes his unique status and his relationship with God, whom he calls his Father. The two are so intimately related that to know one is to know the other. To see Jesus is to see the Father. The Father lives in the Son and the Son in the Father. They are inseparably united. And that is why Jesus can say that there is no other way to come to the Father because he is the only one who perfectly knows God, the only one who can perfectly reveal God because he and the Father are one. And all that Jesus says and does reflects the work and the words of the Father. The miracles that they have seen are the works of the, that the Father has done through the Son. The teachings that they have heard are the words that the Father has given the Son to speak. Through Jesus, the Father has made himself known to the world because the two live in each other. Theologians refer to this as perichoresis, the mutually interpenetrating, mutually indwelling relationship of the three persons of the Godhead. Now, if that sounds like something that's way too complicated for ordinary people to understand, imagine what the disciples felt like hearing that for the first time. They'd become familiar with Jesus' language of calling God his Father, and they recognized that in some way, he, they couldn't quite explain it, but he had a different connection to God than they did. He was a man like them, but more. He was somehow also uniquely God's Son. But now they're hearing him speak about God in a way that was even harder to understand. God had not simply given Jesus the power to do miracles and the extraordinary wisdom and authority to teach and interpret the scripture as he did. Jesus was saying that God himself was united with Jesus, that they were one, which meant that this man that they'd been living with for three years was himself divine. God somehow lived in him lived within him. This was all so very confusing, especially since he kept speaking about leaving and going away and coming back to them. Weren't they here in Jerusalem for his grand entrance, for the big reveal of who he was and the time for the kingdom of heaven to come? But Jesus' words, beginning in verse 12, get even more confusing. Jesus is going back to the Father. And because of that, the Father's going to send the Spirit of Truth, an advocate, the, the paraclete, who is going to live in them in the same way that the Father lives in Jesus. And as a result of this, the disciples will live in Jesus and in God, and God will live in them. And in fact, it's through the coming of this paraclete to live in them that the Father and the Son will make their home the place of their constant presence in them. It's just all so confusing. Jesus was trying to prepare them for what was about to happen. But the problem was, they just couldn't see it at the time. It wasn't until afterwards, 
after the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, that they were able to understand what Jesus had told them that night. In that moment, it just didn't make any sense. Where was he going? Why couldn't they come along? Why would they need an advocate, someone who's going to help them if they got into trouble? Another, a different advocate. And what trouble was coming? What the disciples couldn't comprehend that night became clear about six weeks later on the day of Pentecost. And it was then that they realized what became a fundamental truth of Christian faith, one of the experiential aspects of Christianity that distinguishes it from all other religions and all other philosophies. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead didn't just bring Jesus relief from suffering and allow him to enter into a glorified existence in preparation for the next age. It wasn't just personal vindication for him and personal conquest of death. His resurrection didn't just prove that it was possible to gain life after death. Now, as a consequence of his resurrection and glorification, Jesus was now able to live in and through his disciples. He could come and not only live with them, but actually live within them through the Holy Spirit. And that means, as he said, that all of the things that Jesus did could now be done by his disciples. Since the Father was the one who did his work through the Son, and the two of them now lived in every disciple through the Spirit of God, then the disciples could do the same works that Jesus did, and even greater works. That was possible because those works were not a product of human effort requiring special skills or training. They were God's works, which God would do through people in whom he lived. People who would obey what he said to do and find his power working through them as a result. All that Jesus did, the ordinary stuff, showing love and kindness to broken people, welcoming outcasts, preaching and teaching uh, the gospel, crossing cultural barriers to bring the love and the truth of God, and the extraordinary stuff, the miraculous stuff, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, driving out demons, even raising the dead, all of that <clears throat> depended completely and only on listening to God and following what he said to do, which meant obeying Jesus and living according to what he said. The power to do those things came from God through his indwelling spirit, not from the disciples themselves. <clears throat> Being a Christian or living the Christian life has never been a matter of trying harder to be good or quitting your bad habits so that you can be a good person instead of a bad person. Being a good person doesn't define what it means to be a Christian, and it is not the goal of Christianity. Being good is certainly a part of what it means to be Christian, and it's certainly a goal for everyone who calls themselves a follower of Christ. It's also true, though, that being a Christian is not a matter of simply blessing all of your favorite sins and ignoring them because, well, you're a good person in your heart, even if you're a wretched and unrepentant, self-centered, ordinary American on the outside. That's the lie that gets told at funeral after funeral after funeral. Well, she was really a good person. But we've never really defined what good means, at least not in biblical terms, when we say that. Jesus makes it very clear in John 14 what it is that's going to distinguish his disciples, his followers. They're going to be indwelt by the Spirit of truth. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, whom the Father and Son will send to live in everyone who confesses Jesus as Lord. And when the Spirit comes to live within you, according to the word of Jesus, we are born again, we are spiritually regenerated. We are given a new heart. That's a poetic way of saying, I'm made new, spiritually alive, at my innermost, at the center of my being, where I'm able to connect with God. <clears throat> the Spirit gives me a new heart, a new desire, a new way of living, a new power to live differently. He gives us spiritual and moral power to do what we ought to do, and to resist the temptation to do what we ought not to do. He gives us strength that comes from God, not just from our own willpower. But he also gives us supernatural power, 
abilities that we do not have on our own. Let's talk a little about these greater works that Jesus said we would do. There's a lot of people who want to avoid the plain sense of this by appealing to the work of the church and sharing the gospel in a way that brings people to salvation. They'll say, well, that's much more important than a miraculous healing of, say, a blind person. They want to insist that Jesus' promise that we'll do greater works only refers to these kinds of deeds. But the fact of the matter is that the works of Jesus to which John is referring and which he has emphasized throughout his gospel are miracles such as healing the blind and the lame. It is true, and I believe it, that leading someone to faith in Jesus is more consequential than healing someone who is sick. It is also true, and I believe it, that developing cures for diseases that could be mass-produced and given to every human society could rightly be construed as a greater work that results in God-given healing for the world. And by, Just as a side note, that has happened a lot in the world. Much of the scientific enterprise in the West comes from the church that began studying science because God made an ordered word and wanted to bring healing to the world. So developing cures for diseases is a greater work that God has given the church to do. That's an achievement that's clearly more significant, more meaningful than healing a single individual, even if that happens through miraculous means. Both of these kinds of works and other things that have benefited humankind have sprung from the power of the Spirit of God in the lives of believers. But we cannot deny what was obvious to the original disciples, that Jesus was promising them that when the Spirit came to live within them, God would work through them in miraculous ways to replicate what they had seen Jesus do among them, healing the sick and the injured, including people with incurable diseases, casting out demons, raising the dead, and doing miracles. And that is why the early church continued to expect Jesus to do his miraculous work among them. That's why Luke starts the book of Acts by saying, in this second volume, I'm tell in my first volume, I told you what Jesus began to do and to teach. Now in the second volume, the implication is the second one's going to tell us what he's continuing to do and to teach through the church. They expected that, and they expected to see Jesus do among them, through them, what he had done before, because Jesus was raised from the dead. That's why Acts records some of the miracles that happened when the disciples carried on with all that Jesus told them to do, what the Spirit of God empowered them to do. God was doing his work through them because the Spirit of God lived in them, because Jesus was raised from the dead and has sent his Spirit to them and empowered them with the same power that he demonstrated in his ministry on earth. But asking God for miracles isn't like going to a convenience store or a vending machine. <clears throat> there isn't a formula for prayer that ensures that God will perform what you ask him to do. And Jesus is not saying that having the Spirit of God within you makes you a magician who can command the elements of the universe to obey your whims. That's why verses 13 and 14 are so important to understand as we think about these promises of Jesus that we will have the power of God in us. What does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Jesus says if we ask anything in his name, he says that he'll grant it to us. But what does that mean? I can tell you with complete certainty that it means more than just tacking those words on at the end of your prayer so we know you're finished. And when we look at this uh, promise, this, what do I want to say? This, when we look at this direction for praying, in the context of John 14, including the immediate context of the surrounding verses, the wider context of chapters 13 to 17 and the rest of the New Testament, what we see is this. To ask in Jesus' name is to present myself before God as a follower of Jesus Christ, someone who is obeying his commands and doing what the Father asks of me. I am doing what Jesus did. He said that he only did what he saw the Father doing, he only spoke what he heard from the Father. So I am presenting myself before God, as Jesus did, with the Father and the Son being in complete agreement. And as his followers then, when I pray, I am asking God for the power to do what he has already told me to do. 
I'm asking God to fulfill what he intends for me, what he commands his church to be and to do. I am praying for the power to be able to obey Jesus' commands and carry out the assignment he has given me. And we all struggle with this. <clears throat> we want certain things, and not always for selfish reasons. I and mean, sometimes, maybe even often, we want good for other people that we don't know how to get for them. We don't have the means to do that. We know what we want, and we often have our own ideas about how God ought to go about getting what we want for these other people that we're praying for. And so we ask God to do that. And honestly, that's not necessarily wrong. In fact, sometimes God will actually grant us what we ask. Just like you sometimes would agree to do what your children asked you to do, you know, as long as it wasn't something that was harmful to them or to others, wasn't contrary to what's good or it went against what God had instructed you to do as a parent. Yeah, sometimes you let them pet. You want that? Okay. And God sometimes does the same thing. He grants us what we've asked for, for someone else or for ourselves. But what's even better is when we ask God to do through us or for us something that he has said that he wants to do, something that's consistent with his purposes for us and for his church and for the world. When we ask God to do something or provide something that's consistent with his nature, with what he has already promised, something that we can see him already doing. We pray in accordance with his word and his nature and his will, and we know that he will do what we are asking. By the way, just a side note here, there's another way we struggle with this, and it's a different way when it comes to praying for other people. My first mentor taught me this. <clears throat> when someone says to you they need $20, and you have $20 in your wallet that you can give to them, you don't need to pray and ask God to miraculously supply this person with $20. Whenever we pray for others, we ought to be listening to see, am I supposed to be the answer to their prayer, or at least part of the answer to their prayer? Not, I might not be the case, but if it is, I ought to know. So when you're doing what God commanded the church, the disciples of Jesus, to do, you can count on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to enable you to do what needs to be done. There's a very good reason why miracles are far more evident and more numerous in areas of the world where the church is bringing the gospel for the very first time or where the church is planting the gospel among a people group that has been dominated by forces of evil that have blinded them to the truth for a long time. Because the power of God is not a plaything. The miracles that serve as demonstrations and signs of God's power are not given to entertain or impress believers. And they do not serve as authentications of our status as a church. They're not spiritual fireworks that we can go, ooh, and ah, over. And they also are not proofs of God's existence for skeptics. You know, Jesus refused to do miracles to validate himself. And he knew that those who wouldn't listen to what he said would never be convinced by any demonstration of spiritual power, no matter how dramatic the miracle was. You can doubt a miracle that happens right smack in front of your face. The Pharisees did. The Sadducees did. Lots of people have done. God miraculously heals someone from a disease, and the doctors say, well, we don't know how that happened. <clears throat> the power of God is given to advance the kingdom of heaven, the miracles that serve as demonstrations and signs of his power are given to destroy the works of the enemy, to push back the forces of demonic strongholds, to release people from the grip of evil. Because Christ is risen, he has sent the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to live in each believer, to be resident in every church. Because the paraclete lives in me, I have the power of God dwelling in me. Because the paraclete resides in our church, we have the power of God available among us when we gather and when we leave to carry out the assignments he's given us separately and corporately. So what does that look like? <clears throat> well, it would help if we make note of what this paraclete has been sent to do. If he comes to empower us for the mission of the church, what are the main ways he does that? These are the main ways. There are some other ways, but these are the main ones. This word, paraclete, <clears throat> NIV translates it advocate. Some other translations use counselor or helper. It's an especially rich word. 
It refers to a person who comes alongside of someone who's in trouble or in need who provides help for them. And the most common way it was used in the original Greek language was to refer to an advocate who would assist someone in a court proceeding. But as Jesus uses the term, it goes way beyond what we would understand the work of a legal attorney to be today. And New Testament scholars agree that there, there really isn't a single English word that adequately conveys what paraclete means. We can isolate three primary roles, though, that the Holy Spirit fills that are indicated by the use of this term. First of all, the word advocate. The Holy Spirit is a witness who convicts and judges. We see this more clearly in chapter 16, verses 7 to 11. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father, and you'll see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit is an advocate for God, because he is God. He takes Jesus' place as the one who reveals God's truth and declares God's will. He declares what sin is, what righteousness is, and what judgment's going to be. Because he lives within the believer, the Holy Spirit is able to communicate with us and show us when we're sinning and when we're living righteously. Let me give you an example. The elders of our church often have to make decisions about what is the right thing for a church to do or how should we as elders respond to a question or to an issue or to a possibility that's on the horizon. We think about what the scripture says. We wrestle with the pros and cons. We try to assess our situation as best we know how. All of that in order to try to discern the voice of the Lord. And that can be very difficult. But there are times when we're in these discussions. I'm listening to everyone. Someone will say something or ask something, and the Holy Spirit will suddenly grab my heart and say, that's the right choice. That's what I want from you. That's how you need to proceed so you can follow righteousness. He's the voice of God. He advocates for God's ways and alerts us what we need to do to line up with God. Sometimes it can be the opposite. (coughs) Excuse me, I'm sorry. I might be heading down a path that looks really fine, only to hear the Holy Spirit tell me, you need to stop right now. I'll tell you a fairly minor, somewhat humorous example that I can distinctly recall from when I was a very young minister. I was leading a small group in the home of a family, and the lady whose home it was had made a delicious dessert for everyone. Uh, I was a lot thinner then and generally able to eat just about anything I wanted without any problems. So when she offered seconds, I gladly took one. And then before I left to go home, since there were still some left, I went ahead and took a third one. And as I, as I was about halfway finished with it, the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit very firmly but gently said to me, that one was sin. Okay. Secondly, he's a helper. The Holy Spirit is one who brings help to us when we're in trouble or need. He provides God's resources for us, empowers us to do what he's convicted us to do. He urges us to repent when we've sinned. He encourages us and strengthens us to hold fast in faith when we're tempted or when we doubt. He enables us to walk in righteousness by showing us what is right, leading us in the right way. The Apostle Paul knew this voice really well. Paul begged God to relieve him of the torment of a relentless demonic voice that condemned him for being a persecutor of the church. And the Holy Spirit told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul learned to lean on God's grace in order to overcome the condemnation that he felt. If you're a follower of Christ, you're familiar with that voice. And you can sense when the Holy Spirit is telling you, you can do this. This command is not too difficult for you. My grace will be sufficient for you too. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit, as paraclete, is a counselor. He counsels us. He instructs us. He reminds us of Jesus' teaching. He brings to mind what God has said in his word so that we have a basis for our faith that's greater than our own understanding. The Holy Spirit will bring scriptures to mind that are just what you need to deal with the situation that's right in front of you. He provides us with wise counsel, directing our lives so that we're able to avoid the mistakes and the traps that would hinder us as we walk in Jesus' steps. I vividly remember an incident 
when I was driving, <clears throat> starting to get cranky. At the time, we only had two children. They were probably three and four years old. Mary's with me. They're in the car seats in the back seat. And as I'm getting grumpier, <clears throat> I suddenly hear a little voice from the back seat start singing. The joy of the Lord is my drink. The joy of the Lord is my drink. The joy of the Lord is my drink. <clears throat> there is absolutely nothing that prepares you to be rebuked by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of a three-year-old. But he was giving me wise counsel and correction to get my attitude straightened out by reminding me what the Word said and doing it through my own children. Because Christ is risen, he has sent the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to live in everyone who calls on the name of the Lord as a follower of Jesus Christ. He's not just there to occupy spiritual space. He's there to bring the power of God to you, the life of God, the goodness of God, the truth of God to you. He's there to advocate for God, to remind you of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is harmful. <clears throat> He's there to help you, to give you strength to live as Jesus commanded. He is there to instruct you, to give you wise counsel, to guide you in the path that leads to life and to assist you when you stumble and you start to get lost. And he is also there to bring the power of God that enables you to do what you ordinarily cannot do, even the miraculous. Whether that happens through your prayers for things that you could not possibly make happen, or through your words that share truth that impacts your neighbor in a way you could never have thought possible, or through you living victoriously over sinful habits and addictions that used to control you and now have been replaced by a life of peace and righteousness because you're following Jesus. Because Christ is risen, because he has sent his Holy Spirit to those who belong to him, you can have the power of God in you, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. The paraclete has been sent. The one who raised Christ from the dead, the power of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And he'll give life to your mortal body.